Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Melissa Murray, and I am the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at New York University School of Law. And I'm also the co-host of the podcast Strict Scrutiny, which is distributed by Crooked Media. And I'm delighted to be here to moderate today's program. I am joined by my good friend, Ellie Mastal, the justice correspondent for The Nation, where he covers the courts, the criminal justice system, and politics. He is also the author of an irreverent but irreverently thoughtful new book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. Allow Me to Retort explains the legal way to protect the rights of women and people of color and stop everything from police brutality to political gerrymandering just by changing a few judges and justices. Ellie's book is an easily digestible argument about what rights we have, what rights he argues the Republicans are trying to take away, and how we might stop them. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and there'll be time for me to ask Ellie your questions. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll get to them later in the program. But please join me right now in welcoming to the Commonwealth Club, Ellie Mastal. So Ellie, there is much to talk about. First of all, um, I think it's an understatement to say this book is irreverent. Um, It is irreverent, it is snarky, it's sometimes profane, but it is the most compelling account of what is actually wrong with the system, the justice system, the judicial system, and the way in which law works to limit rather than to enhance rights. So I just wanna ask sort of a basic question why this book and why now? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Commonwealth Club. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for doing um, this conversation with me, Professor Murray. Uh, for those who don't know, Professor Murray and I go way back. She read me before it was cool, um, back when I was uh, um, blogging for Above the Law. Um, so, and, and as you kind of point out, some of that blogging kind of uh, a background, I think, comes out um, in the book. I try not to lose that sense of just talking to kind of being in conversation um, with regular people. In terms of why the book and why now, look, we we are at a time of unprecedented conservative takeover of the third branch of government, right? It it goes beyond um, the 6-3 Supreme Court, although, my goodness, 6-3 to hardcore conservatives control now the Supreme Court. It goes all throughout the federal judiciary, and it goes from, from where I sit to a way that we talk about the courts and legal issues and ideas that has almost been completely co-opted by conservative ideas, conservative thought, conservative language. We fight on the ground that conservatives want us to fight on. Um, And so we, we kind of start the game losing. And so I wanted to write about how that's wrong. And how there, there's a whole different way of thinking about our rights, our responsibilities, about the Constitution itself. There's a whole different language of law um, that we can use, that we can think about, and that if we did use, um, would arrest the reduction of rights for people of color and minorities um, that are being spearheaded by the conservative movement in this country. It's felt timely to me um, because of how ascendant conservative ideology and philosophy is in our courts and in just our general public discourse. The audience here, I think, is everyone who reads and cares about the courts and about the Constitution and justice. But I also take from your words that the real audience are Democrats, right? Democrats who have not really been playing with all of the arrows in their quivers at this point. And so What would you say to those in power right now about the best way to use the law and the court and how we should be thinking about responding to this conservative takeover and this conservative ideology that really is ascendant? Republicans and conservatives are conducting a war on rights and Democrats have not taken the field 
and they've not taken the field because they will not adopt uh, the language and the legal ideology that has been laid before them um, for a long period of time. They won't adopt the language of an Earl Warren or a Justice Brennan or a Justice Brandeis or a Justice Thurgood Marshall, right? And so what, or even a Justice Sotomayor or a Justice, uh, potentially a Justice Brown Jackson, right? Um, there, there is a way of understanding our rights that is not grounded in the original and intent and ideas of slavers, colonists, and rich white people willing to make deals with slavers and colonists, right? Like we can reject that that vision of America and embrace a more fair, a more equal, a more pluralistic vision of America. But Democrats have to join the game and realize that the courts are important. The, the, The when you ask, you know, to really answer the question, what do Democrats get wrong? They they don't understand, they don't seem to embrace and understand just how powerful the third branch of government is, just how powerful Article 3 is. Folks, Article 3 has a veto power over Articles 1 and 2. That's not how the Constitution was written. That's just what, you know, that's just what the court aggrandized to itself when it when it gave itself the power of judicial review the courts gave themselves the power to declare acts of Congress signed by the president unconstitutional. Folks, other industrialized Western democracies do not do it this way, all right? We have one of the most powerful Supreme Courts in the world. I think like India is our competitor for that, but this is not how they do it in Canada. This is not how they do it in Germany. This is not how they do it in South Africa. So we have an extremely powerful Supreme Court but Democrats act like all we have to do is elect the next savior, whether it's Barack Obama or Joe Biden, like whoever the next savior is supposed to be. They think that we just have to elect a president and everything's going to work out and be hunky dory. No, we have to we have to change how the third branch of government operates if we want to get anything done. And Democrats don't always understand that. I think this is an excellent point. And I I recall back in August of 2020, when the Democrats had their national convention, there was a lot of discussion of all of the great things that Joe Biden had done throughout his very illustrious career, first as a senator and then as vice president. And they talked about the Violence Against Women Act and his work with Obamacare and his work with Dreamers and the immigration reform. At no point did anyone acknowledge that all of those things had actually been upended and curtailed and disrupted by a five to four majority of the Supreme Court. The civil rights remedy of VAWA was struck down in United States versus Morrison. The ACA is constantly under threat in the courts. And no one would acknowledge that the courts are, by their nature, minoritarian institutions that can actually cancel out majoritarian domestic policy. Um, so so I, I think that point is, is really apt. But It's a great entry for the book. You start with the premise that the Constitution, as we know it, was created and drafted in a moment that can only be described as a demographic deficit, right? Um, A demographic, a democratic, whatever you want to call it, it is a deficit. Certain voices aren't represented. And indeed, you argue certain voices are overrepresented. There are those who are there at the Constitutional Convention for the purpose of re-entrenching white supremacy, re-entrenching property rights. And that's the document that we have inherited. And so you sort of start with the premise that this document is a problem and us expressing a kind of fidelity to its original interpretation is also a problem. And yet this is the fight we're having right now. Um, The conservatives argue that the only way to interpret the Constitution is by looking to the way it would have been interpreted in 1787 or alternatively in 1867 when we had a second founding moment with the Reconstruction Amendments. What's wrong with this vision of originalism, with this fidelity to text that we see in the interpretation of statutes? What are we missing and how can we fight back? Yeah. So first of all, originalism is intellectually bankrupt. All right. Like the idea that I should have to interpret laws based on what my ancestral captors thought is simply is simply illegitimate. Like, no, I reject that. I do not care what my captors thought I should be living under. Like that's that's just not something that I agree with. Right. Um, One of the cleanest one of the cleanest ways to see this. And I talk about this in the book. I have a whole chapter on this in the book. I think one of the cleanest ways to see originalism, originalism's intellectual bankruptcy is through a discussion of the Eighth Amendment. Eighth Amendment bars cruel and unusual punishment. Now, just saying that out loud, most people can understand 
cruel and unusual punishment are pretty vague terms. Constitution didn't bother to, de- to, de- to, to define what cruel means. It didn't bother to define what unusual means. So it wasn't really all that good of an idea. So how do we resolve that ambiguity? Well, originalists say that we should look to what the founders, the people who wrote the Eighth, the Eighth Amendment, James Madison, and his cohorts meant. They say that we should look to the original public meaning of those words as they were understood in 1787 when they came out with the Constitution. And I say, what? You want me to consult the slavers about what they thought cruel and unusual meant? Like, that's actually what you that's actually what you're selling, Neil Gorsuch. Like, that's actually what you're selling, John Roberts. No, no, I reject that. I do not care what people with such a moral deficit that they could enslave people, keep them in bondage, and literally light firecrackers up their backsides if they misbehave. No, I do not care what they thought punishments should be. I'm going to. I'll look to. I'll look to the moon. I will. I will pick. I, I will. I will find. I'll look to a comic book about what cruel and unusual should mean before I look to James Madison. Are you kidding me? So that that's 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 where the that's where the fight is. That's where the debate is. I reject out of hand the idea that the the people who enslaved us have a valid you know a a are a valid starting point for what the laws mean now. The text that's a different conversation. I'll I'll, I'll I understand English. We got to start somewhere. I'll read the text and we can iterate and interpret from there. But that these that 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 somehow we need a. Neil Gorsuch's Ouija board uh, to figure out what Thomas Jefferson really meant. Uh, please get out, get in my face with that. There's a kind of internal tension here because you were arguing that originalism is by itself morally and intellectually bankrupt. And, and I completely understand the argument that you're making about that. But it's not just an argument about originalism as an interpretive philosophy. At bottom, you're essentially arguing that the Constitution itself is morally and intellectually bankrupt. So is this really just about a different interpretive view that you have, or should we be scrapping this altogether? Oh, Professor Murray, why don't you get me in trouble now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I that, that That is a tension. Look, at the, let's start here. Um, South Africa, right? They free Nelson Mandela. He becomes the president of this new South Africa, right? They they, they reject their their apartheid ways. What do they do? Do they stick a couple amendments on their Afrikaans apartheid constitution and be like, okay, we're good now? Or or, uh, do they throw it out the window and start again? And if you look at the history of South Africa, what they did in the 90s after Mandela became president was that they burned their stupid apartheid Afrikaans constitution they started again with a new constitutional convention brought with all of the people, people who had been historically left out of, of, of writing written constitutions. And they came up with a new document. They took two years to do it. And right now, if you look on the international stage, this is going to surprise a lot of Americans. But if you look on the international stage, it is the South African constitution that is regularly held up as one of the best written constitutions in terms of the protection of human rights and democracy um, in the world, as opposed to the American constitution. What did we do when we had to overcome our apartheid constitution? And that's what the original constitution was. Black people held in bondage, counted as three-fifths of people. That is an apartheid system violently enforced, by the way, by angry mobs of white people roving the South. Um, What did we do to overcome our apartheid constitution? We stuck a couple of amendments on it, right? We basically, you know, it's like we, it's like you had a, you have a Ford Focus and you go and you steal the hubcaps off a Cadillac and say, I'm driving a Cadillac now. No, you ain't. It's still a Ford Focus. I can tell. Um, and we called it all good. One of the debates, one of the core debates in this country is basically whether the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment worked. If you think it worked, and I'm one of those people who tends to think that the Reconstruction's amendments worked, the Reconstruction Amendments and the 19th Amendment, those they weren't passed at the same time because, again, white men. But like, I like to think of them all four of them together. Um, I tend to think that the Reconstruction Amendments worked, and so to make them work, every other thing has to be strained through the analysis of the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th, 19th Amendments. 
People say like, oh, originalism, what the Republicans are so good at is they have a snappy catchphrase for their stupid intellectual uh, interpretive philosophy. I got a snappy catchphrase, catchphrase for mine, too. I'm a 14th Amendment ologist or this person. Right. Like just like for me, the Constitution is the 14th Amendment and some suggestions. So you're you at heart, I think you are something of an institutionalist because you don't necessarily want to scrap the whole thing. You really do believe in the promise of the 14th Amendment, although I will argue as a constitutional law professor that the promise of the 14th Amendment was upended even before it got going in the mm. 1870s. And you talk about that in the book as well. Um, but you actually are institutionally minded. You want to make this work better. So are there particular places where you think a more 14th Amendment reconstruction amendment-ish view of constitutional interpretation would yield marginally or markedly different results than what we see now? Sure. We can start with the 15th Amendment, right? I mean, the the entire discussion of voting rights um, basically comes down to whether or not you think the 15th Amendment is real, because white conservatives will tell you that it ain't. The 15th Amendment passed after the Civil War was immediately ignored by the Supreme Court from the end of Reconstruction until 1965. They just took the 15th Amendment and they stuffed it in the locker and they pretended it didn't exist. When they finally rediscovered, when the when the 15th Amendment was finally unearthed and, and, and reimagined during the civil rights era, we passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which is my pick, by the way, as the most important piece of legislation in American history. Why? Because it is the first piece of legislation that made the democratic promise of universal suffrage real throughout the country. We, we did not live a day in this country with anything approaching universal suffrage until 1965. Now, from 1965 on, what we saw was an amazing success story, if you really think about it, in terms of minorities and Black people in particular rising up the moment they took their foot off our neck. In about 40 years, we went from an oppressed people to the first black president in 40, that's, that's in a generation. That's, that's a pretty good track record. And white people got so pissed off about that. What's the first thing they did before the black president was even out of office? They took away the Voting Rights Act. That's the first, before they went with their calm and bigoted orange person, the first thing white conservatives did was to take away the, the Voting Rights Act. John Roberts, 2013, Shelby County beholder eviscerates Section 5 preclearance of the Voting Rights Act, and that essentially took the 15th Amendment and stuck it right back in a locker. Now, I interpret the 15th Amendment so expansively that I think that it can stop not just the obvious racist um, examples of Republican voter suppression. I think the 15th Amendment can be used to stop gerrymandering. I think the 15th Amendment can use can be used to stop a lot of things um, that, that I think it can be used to stop the filibuster. Like, you, we could go down the list of things that I think the 15th Amendment could do. But Republicans won't let it do anything. I, I, I'm, I do want to hear about this hidden power of the 15th Amendment. So like, let's bracket that for a minute. But I do think it's really interesting. And it's sort of the first time I've actually thought about it in this context. But you're telling a story of racial progress. And it's exactly that story of racial progress that Chief Justice John Roberts marshals to strike down the preclearance formula in Shelby County. And he tells a story that, that is true about more and more minorities voting and we cannot be shackled to the past. The 15th Amendment is not the promise of constant punishment for past sins. It is about the promise of a better future. So how do we reconcile um, in this world where racial progress can be figured in many different ways? Like, how can you actually wrestle with the fact that there was racial progress and in fact, it was then used to retard that progress? Yeah, well, first there's the Ruth Bader Ginsburg rejoinder to John Roberts's um, argument where she says in her dissent in Shelby County that throwing away the, the Voting Rights Act is like throwing away an umbrella in the middle of the rain because you're not getting wet. Who which is a very a nice way of saying Who knew what? she was a Rihanna fan? Nobody right? <laughs> Like, like that, that is what, that is what Shelby County is. But at, at a, at a more kind of fun, fundamental level, it, it, it really also goes to the function of the courts. I mean, one of the, 
if if Republican if conservative Republicans were not hypocrites, they would be more pissed at Shelby County than I am. Because what Shelby County really is, is John Roberts, an unelected, unaccountable Supreme Court justice, imposing his view of social progress upon the rest of the country over the objection of 98 senators, a voice vote in Congress, and a Republican president. Because that is what the Voting Rights Act was. The Voting Rights Act had been reauthorized by a voice vote in Congress, 98 senators, and President George doesn't care about Black people, W. Bush, signed the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006. And it's that reauthorization that John Roberts threw out of the window based on his cockamamie Miami theory about social progress. Now, in our system, we're not supposed to have, according to conservatives, mind you, I'm making the I'm making the Republican argument right now. According to the Republicans, we're not supposed to have Supreme Court justices trying to engineer social change through the courts. I was Which is exactly what Roberts did. It's Congress that's supposed to be able to tell us when racism has been has been defeated or not. So, have you are you basically saying that John Roberts is the same kind of judicial activist that Harry Blackman was when he wrote Roe versus Wade in 1973, or Earl Warren was when Miranda versus Arizona was decided in the 1960s? Because this is the wrap that conservatives have given to the court, like no more activist judges. Originalism is about fidelity to text, not about your own personal political ideology or policy preferences. But are you suggesting then that John Roberts is doing the same kind of judicial activism that he accuses others of? Indeed, I am. Because indeed he is. Because he, John Roberts, at the end of the day, cares more about his political ideology and his political outcomes than he does about any kind of judicial principle. If he cared about judicial restraint, he would have upheld the Voting Rights Act. He wouldn't have eviscerated it. And remember, it's not just Section 5. Section 5 is what he did in 2013. Well, just this past summer in Brnovich v. Arizona, he then went on and joined Samuel Alito eviscerating Section 2. But what was that? See, that's, that's, that's the thing about Roberts that people need to understand. Roberts has been an enemy of Black people voting for his entire career. And when I say his entire career, I literally mean his first job after clerking so his first real job was working in the Reagan Justice Department, where he was brought on specifically to come up with a way to defeat the 1982 amendments to the Voting Rights Act, the ones that expanded um, uh, the Voting Rights Act to, to punish not just ob- overt discrimination, not just discriminatory um, intent, but discriminatory effect. Because before 1982, as long as the state legislature said, well, I didn't mean to keep black people from voting, that was okay. And in 1982, we had an amendment that said like, actually, if you have force and effect of keeping black people from voting, that's just as bad. That was the amendment that John Roberts was brought on to defeat. And Reagan was looking for a way to defeat this amendment. But even Ronald Reagan, who started his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, that's Mississippi burning country for those paying along at home, and literally said during the during his presidential campaign that the Voting Rights Act humiliates the South. That is Ronald Reagan. Even Ronald Reagan had to go along eventually with the 1982 Voting Rights Amendment. That's how popular people voting was back in 1982. It is John Roberts who harbored that anger at those amendments that he played the one, John Roberts been waiting for black people in the tall grass for a long time. And so the decision in Brnovich v. Arizona was actually John Roberts finally getting to eviscerate the 1982 voting rights amendments that he long um, had antipathy, uh, uh, that he was long against. So that, that's who we're dealing with when we're talking about John Roberts. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, John Roberts not only joined Samuel Alito's opinion in the Brnovich cases from last summer, uh, a couple of summers before in 2019 in a case called Ruscio versus Common Cause, he determined that federal courts cannot intervene to hear cases involving partisan gerrymandering. So I want to get back to this point you made. How can a more generative vision of the 15th Amendment actually be used to address these questions, um, questions of racial gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering that have been essentially foreclosed by the courts through justiciability decisions or alternatively through the narrowing of legislation like the Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights Act says that to make the 15th Amendment work, that the right 
um, uh, to uh, to for, for voting for regardless of race, color, or creed cannot be denied or diluted on account of race or diluted. And it's the dilution of the vote beyond the straight denial of the vote that gerrymandering does. And so a robust interpretation of the 15th Amendment would also say that, that the dilution of the black vote or of minority votes or of Native, you know, Native American votes in, in, in Arizona, um, Latino votes in Texas, black votes in Georgia, that these dilution of votes are offensive to the 15th Amendment, just like the actual straight up denial of votes that, let's say, Florida does when it r- refuses to allow a uh, 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 released uh, former prisoners um, the right to vote, right? So you could have a 15th Amendment that is chesty and strong and goes around stopping these kinds of gerrymanders, but again, Republicans won't let it happen. And, I, and you know, I, and this is what I'm saying, like, the, the way to fix that is not to change Republican minds. Republicans don't like Black people voting. That's kind of consistent, right? Like, oh, conservatives don't like black people voting, I should say. Like, you know, what conservatives call themselves in the morning, I care about less. In the Right now, they call themselves Republicans. Back in the day, they called themselves Democrats. I don't really care what label they put. The conservative party has been against black people voting for a very long time in this country. And the liberal party has never done enough to secure the voting power of minorities when they have a chance. Um, so I yes, a robust uh, version of the Fifteenth Amendment. Think about it this way as well with with Rucho when he and I talk about this a little bit in, in my book because my dad was a local politician and his job was basically to be a gerrymander. Like that that was like I I knew what gerrymandering was when I was twelve because that's what my dad did like professionally. Um, and one of the things that one of the real dodges that Roberts does there that you wouldn't know unless you knew what gerrymandering, how it really worked, is that he's trying to make a distinction between political gerrymanders and racial gerrymanders, as if those are two completely different things. Folks, they ain't. It, 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 when, when a politician is sitting trying to draw a map, they're not taking political factors to one side and racial factors to the other side. They're putting it all in the same pot. Well, they're they looking often at overlap. They in, in most jurisdictions they overlap. Substantially. Right. Um, a lot of minority voters tend to vote Democrat. A lot of Democrats tend to be minority. I mean, th- those are those are or one to one overlap. But general, you know, economic situations, those kind of overlap. Um, you know, politicians are looking at every, you know, they're looking at church to strip club ratios. You know, how many liquor stores do you got in your neighborhood? How many gun shops do you have in your neighborhood? They're looking at all of that when they're drawing a map. And to act like one is okay and one is verboten is just, it's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous position that Roberts has, but you wouldn't know how ridiculous it is unless you've actually like kind of been in the room where it happens and seen one of these maps made. Can we turn a little, shift gears a little bit? Like for the last 24 months, we have been absolutely consumed with this question of police violence. And you talk about this at length in the book, including sharing your own story about being stopped by the police, not once, not twice, but three times. And you specifically focus on the third time where you came very close to being a casualty of a police stop. Can you talk a little bit about how the court itself has cultivated the conditions where African-Americans, people of color are routinely targeted for these kinds of stops. And the police often have widened opportunities to use violence without recourse. Conservatives always want to tell you that policing is a local municipal issue, that there's limited federal power um, to change anything in, in policing. And too often the Democrats like to go along, especially national Democrats, because it lets them off the hook. Oops, like I can't do anything more, black people. I'm just a federal official, right? Don't, don't, don't believe it. Don't buy it. There, I can, I can take a significant bite out of police brutality. I can, I can significantly change the amount of brutality that this system allows if you just let me change three Supreme Court decisions. That's literally all I need. First, Terry B. Ohio. That's the stop case. That's the that's the non-arrest stop case. That's the case that allows cops to stop me as a black man on a hunch that maybe I'm thinking about committing a crime one day. That's ridiculous. And if I could change that standard, that would do a lot of. Can I ask about Terry for a minute? That's a Warren court. 
decision. That's a that's a nine zero decision. That's a Warren Court decision with Justice Thurgood Marshall yes. um, concurring in that decision. Um, that was that. Look, you understand. So, if we want to go into Terry. The, the, the issue was that this uh, this uh, potential criminal was seen casing a joint, like literally going back 12, you know, six to 12 times, making a circuit around a joint. Eventually, a cop was just like, I wonder what was going on with him, stopped him, did a immediate search of his person to make sure that, you know, that he was safe, found a gun that, Terry, you know, and then basically found the gun. And and uh, eventually Terry was convicted of, you know, attempted robbery or whatever it was. And so this case went to the Supreme Court because Terry was like, you had no reason to stop me other than that I was, you know, a person. Um, and, uh, and Terry lost. And the Warren Court said there has to be some ability for a police officer to question a suspect before the suspect has done something so obviously criminal, right? Before they have, you know, something before probable cause that the suspect committed a crime, the police officer has to be able to question to conduct an investigation. And in the course of, co of conducting those questions, of course, they should be allowed to frisk very lightly the outside of a person's clothing um, to make sure that there are no obvious weapons that the person can have to harm the police officer, right? And the Warren and Marshall, they struggle with it. And Warren has a long thing about the Fourth Amendment and it's sacrosanct and but, they, but they're, they trying to, they're trying to figure out this basic way, right? Um, and at the time, so Terry v. Ohio was, the, by the way, the first case that was argued by two black people um, in front of the Supreme Court. The prosecutor who argued in front of the Supreme Court was black and the defense attorney who argued in front of the Supreme Court was black. And this man named Louis Stokes. Louis Stokes went on to be uh, one of the first black, uh, I think the first black representative congressperson from Ohio. And Stokes saw the whole thing coming. Stokes, Stokes uh, said that, that what that decision would do would basically unleash racial profiling. He said it to Marshall in his face at, at, the, at, the, at the court. He said it for the rest of his life. And Louis Stokes was absolutely right. Because once they had the decision that you could stop somebody, it went from officer sees a man casing a joint six to 12 times to officer has a hunch of that black guy's up to no good. So we just we, we just went from what in Marshall and Warren's mind was still a very high standard for stop to where we are now, which is just basically the cop doesn't even need to have a reason um, to stop a person. So that that that's the problem with Terry. It, it's it's one of those ideas that's kind of good on paper, but you give white cops an inch and they will take a mile. Like white, basically, it is a power that white cops cannot be trusted to use to wield um, uh, fairly. Um, because of racism in our society. So yeah, you change Terry, you you significantly decrease the ability for cops to stop you. Um, another case that would change is Graham v. Connor. That's the use of force case. That's the case that says um, cops' cops' use of force, um, the reasonableness of that force is determined by a cop on the scene as opposed to, you know, anybody else. I would go for anybody else than a cop on the scene trying to tell me whether or not his use of force against me was reasonable. And the yeah. idea behind this is that um, rather than some objective, reasonable person, we basically credit whatever fears, however rational they may be in the moment that the cop has when he or she actually ex exercises this force. And, and you use the example of Michael Brown in Ferguson about this. Can, can you maybe say a little bit about that example? So Michael Brown murdered in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, if you read the deposition, you read the definition deposition of Darren Wilson, um, the officer who shot and killed Michael Brown. And what you read is the thoughts of an un unhinged crazy person. Darren Wilson says, oh, when I grabbed onto Michael Brown, it felt like he was Hulk Hogan. It felt like he was Hulk Hogan and I was a five-year-old. Man, Michael Brown was a big boy. He was 6'4", you know? Sorry, Michael Brown was 6'6". Six, six. Darren Wilson was 6'4". All right. There was not the kind there was not a Hulk Hogan versus a five year old despair uh, size disparity. Right. Um, uh, Darren Wilson said, well, I looked into his eyes. He looked like a demon. Well, that's not reasonable because he wasn't a demon. He didn't. He, he had no he was not Hellboy. All right. And so but but because of the way the law works. Darren Wilson has to say that he feared for his life in order to justify shooting an unarmed person to death. Well, the only way you can make the case that he feared for his life is if Darren Wilson is a crazy, hysterical coward who fears for his life very easily. It's and the way the law works, as long as there are enough cops who are similarly hysterical cowards, then they can get away with murder. 
And that should not be a constitutional principle. So basically your point is that Graham, the case, lays out the conditions whereby in order to be justified in the use of excessive force, cops basically have to say that they're constantly in fear of their lives, which leads to, I think, a probably not untrue narrative of policing being dangerous, but perhaps overstates the degree to which individuals present that danger and perhaps hyper hyper identifies those who are not like the officer as those who pose the most risk of danger. Like whether or not my constitutional rights exist should not be dependent on the hysteria of the officer who stops me. Right. Like it, it, like that, 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 that to me sounds like is a simple proposition, right? If the officer who stops me is, a, you know, I'm, so I'm driving the car and I get stopped by an officer and the officer is afraid that I'm going to roll down my window and suck out his soul with my big black lips. That's not reasonable. I don't care how many officers agree with him. That's not reasonable. That should not be a reason to shoot me. But instead, we have these situations where officers can say patently unreasonable, crazy, hysterical things and yet have constitutional protections for their violations because other cops would agree with that hysterical uh, 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 position. So simply changing the standard in Graham to being a reasonable person as opposed to assessing reasonableness from the perspective of the cop, like making it objective as opposed to subjective, would be one way. You say, so what's the third way? So we're changing the Terry stops, we're changing the standard to a reasonable person standard in Graham. What's the third? Qualified immunity. Bye-bye. Bye bye. You don't get that anymore. Just take it. Just take it away from law enforcement. What I'm do we still do about police unions. Then what? What do we do about police unions? Who? Who? What? What? Who? I, I, like like I no. I don't care. No. We 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 roll over the police unions just like we've rolled over pretty much every other union. And like why is why do police unions be get to be the only union that still has teeth? Right. It's basically in this country the police union and the Major League Baseball Players Association union are the only unions that still get to have teeth in this country. Well, I would take that away from the police unions. There there is there is no there is no reason there is no good reason to me for in 2022 a cop to have qualified immunity for constitutional violations they commit while on the job. They have lost that privilege. You want to give qualified immunity to a politician so they don't get sued for theft when they sign the property tax assessment. Fine. That's not, I'm happy for qualified immunity for people who don't have the ability to kill people. But once you get the imprimatur of the state that you can use violence against me, the very least thing that we can do is take away your qualified immunity to use that violence without accountability for your actions just because you say that you did it while on the job. What about prosecutors? Yeah, I would probably take it away from them too. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I'm a little bit less uh, uh, strident about that. Like I think that police officers have no have no decent reason to ask for qualified immunity. Um, I do think that prosecutors should have a limited reason to ask for qualified immunity because there is mistakes, mistakes are made. We have an adversarial system that requires defense attorneys to zealously advocate for their clients, even clients that are probably often very, you know, suspect. Um, that same adversarial system requires prosecutors to zealously advocate for the state and arguably the victims of crime. And we don't want to um, overly chill that zealous advocacy, but we must punish prosecutors who I would say purposefully get it wrong. You know, I would say- Are you giving more grace to lawyers like you and me than you are to rank and file police officers? Indeed. You know what the difference is though, Melissa? It's not because I'm a lawyer and not a cop. It's because well, I don't have a gun. Those are actual lawyers. Right. That. right. By the way, just, just, just so you know, play one on TV. Yes, but not no, 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 actual clients. No, they have like issues and like they're people. You know, uh, the difference between my grace to the legal profession that I don't extend to the police profession is the gun. If if you want, have, so so we can also play it this way. I will allow cops to keep their qualified immunity if they turn in their guns. Like they do in the UK, by the way. Like it's entirely possible to police a large urban environment um, without firearms. The, the the Mounties do it all the damn time, 
right? So we we could have a system like that where you get qualified immunity, but you don't get your gun. But once you get a gun, no, then 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 the levels have gotten off the charts here. And there's got to be some way for me to hold you accountable for your actions with that firearm. Let me switch gears. Um, you mentioned guns. Two major cases before the Supreme Court this term, one that deals with the possible expansion of the Second Amendment to allow for open carrying in public of a weapon, and then also a case that likely will call the question of whether Roe versus Wade will continue as a precedent. Uh, that's the Dobbs case. Say a little bit about um, this constitution of ours and the question of unenumerated rights and the question of rights that are explicitly enumerated in the Bill of Rights. What's the tension here and how do we resolve it? Yeah, so I mean, I don't even know that there's a tension here. The conservative interpretation of the Second Amendment was invented in the 70s by the NRA. That it just it wasn't in the founding, it wasn't part of our history. The NRA invented made that up in the 70s um, for political gains. That, that that's all it is. Um, the you know why the Second Amendment is there? And I, I gotta talk about this a little bit in the book. Second Amendment is there, and it, it, the 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 first part of the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia. That's the part that the conservatives act like, oh, that just, they can read that. They try to wipe that part out of the Constitution. In fact, that was a real deal. The, having a militia was a real deal, especially for the Southern states, because that's how they stopped slave revolts. You no, know, Carol Anderson and I did a talk here at the Commonwealth Club a couple of months ago um, in her book, The Second Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America, really details it. And it's magnificent. So for all of those who are in the audience, um, it was a really terrific conversation and Carol Anderson explains this as well, but she sort of makes an originalist argument about the Second Amendment linking it to the preservation of slave militia, like militias for putting down slave revolts. So, right, so that that's where, if you wanna make the originalist argument for the Second Amendment, that's where it is, right? It's this personal right to self-defense. That's the thing that they invented that's basically Scalia invented in DC versus Heller. So the Second Amendment, everything that people think about the Second Amendment is just is just not it's just not true. It's just not where it comes from, right? So I don't even think there's a tension there. I think there is a, a just a willful misread of the constitutional text and history on the Second Amendment. When it comes to a woman's right to choose, I will stipulate, and I have always stipulated, that the Constitution does not explicitly say that a woman has a right to reproductive rights. You know why? Because the white male slavers and colonists who wrote the Constitution didn't think women had any rights at all. So, of course, they didn't think that women had a right to their own bodies. They didn't think that women had a right to own property or vote or finish her sentences. So, yeah. I'm, sorry, but it's I'm not, it's not the best <laughs> argument to make about you're, you're on a roll. Uh, it's not the best argument to make about abortion because there are lots of things that are not explicitly enumerated in the Constitution but we hold them as sacrosanct fundamental rights nonetheless, the right to marry, the right of parents to raise their children in the manner of their choosing, executive privilege, which we've heard about ad nauseum. And there's a great question from one of the audience members about the Trump archives. Um, so why is it that we are so fixated on this issue of unenumerated rights when there's so much that the Constitution purposefully left vague or absent with the understanding that it could not have been an exhaustive document. Because the people who are concerned with the expansion of rights are the same people who had all the rights at the beginning, right? It's like, it's if one way of telling the story of America is the race and the attempt for everybody else to get the same rights that rich white people had in 1787. Like I, as a black man in 2022, I'm still just trying to get back to where white people were in 1787. And the, the, the countervailing force against that story have been the white people who had their rights in 1787, trying to stop everybody else from getting them, trying to put up additional hurdles and additional roadblocks to other people getting to the point that they had they were born into. That, that's one way of telling the story. That, and that is why there are people who are so concerned with unenumerated rights. Look, James Madison, the person who was forced to write the Bill of Rights, who didn't want to. Remember, James Madison didn't think we needed the Bill of Rights, thought the Constitution was fine as is. You know, James Madison, people need to think of him like Aaron making the golden calf, right? He knows it's wrong, but all the people are just like, we need a God, we need a God. And he's like, okay, right? While, you know, Moses is off somewhere else 
um, getting the commandments. Aaron, okay, here's the kid. right. That's the that's the Bill of Rights. While he's doing that, Madison is like, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself an out because he knows that some fool in the future will think, and this is why he says that he doesn't want to write the Bill of Rights in the first place, because he thinks that some fool in the future will think that the only rights that we have are the ones that he bothered to write down, which of course he couldn't possibly do that. You can't possibly write down all the rights that people should have. So he gives himself an out. That out is the Ninth Amendment, where it says explicitly that the rights not included in this doc, that this, that this document does not represent a full complete list of all rights, that there are unenumerated rights that he didn't have time to write down, but still exist. That's the Ninth Amendment. And conservatives, for all of their original textual hypocrisy, conservatives act like the Ninth Amendment doesn't exist at all. Literally, Robert Bork, the, 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 the founder in many ways, the intellectual founder of originalism, says that the Ninth Amendment is an ink blot under which nobody can know what's under there, and so acts like it doesn't exist. And Antonin Scalia kept right on with that tradition, and Neil Gorsuch keeps right on with that tradition of acting like the Ninth Amendment doesn't exist. But the Ninth Amendment does exist, and it does it does protect rights that aren't enumerated in the rest of the document, which is why I go to the Ninth Again, I go to the 14th Amendment first and foremost, and I'm like, well, equal protection. If men get to control their reproductive cycle, then women get to control their reproductive cycle. Get out of my face. However. If the 14th Amendment doesn't work for you, then we have the Ninth Amendment, which says that there are more rights, including, I would argue, the rights to privacy that are not enumerated in the Constitution. And quite frankly, Professor Murray, if you don't like my 14th Amendment argument and my Ninth Amendment argument, I have a 13th Amendment argument because right there in the 13th Amendment, it says forced labor is unconstitutional. Forcing a woman to labor against her will for free is something that shouldn't be unconstitutional. I believe we fought a war over that. So there are a number of questions in the chat from audience members, and they're really excellent. Are they all, why are you so angry? <laughs> I think we're taking your anger as a given. Um, so one person notes um, that we yesterday um, heard oral arguments at the court in a case called West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. And this person asks, are you worried about regulatory agencies being dissolved by this current court? Yes. Yes. Part of the long-term ideological goals of the conservative movement has been to take away the regulatory power of the state. And they do it through specifically this attack on executive agencies because folks, executive agencies are where the science is. All right, you've seen Congress, I've seen Congress, you voted for Congress people. They're not scientists, they're not physicists. They're what not about that space laser? <laughs> They're, they're, they're not experts, all right? They're experts at talking and hair. They're not experts in on the ground of the issues that we have to face. We have, we have professionals. We have often non-political appointee professionals in the executive agencies that are supposed to do the work of turning congressional law into something real and practical and manageable in this country, right? So when Congress, so Congress passes a law, we should have clean water. We should have clean air. It is the executive agencies that figure out what clean air means, what clean water means, and how we're going to go and get that done. What the conservatives want is to basically eviscerate the power of the executive agencies to do that work because they then allow judges to aggrandize themselves and be the ones who decide what clean air or clean water means and requires. It is a power grab by the conservative majority against the elected branches of government. And that's how we have to understand it. And that's how we have to talk about it. But in terms of what's happening, yeah, we're going to, we're losing. We're absolutely losing. And again, this is one of those issues where Democrats have not taken the field. If you poll any person under 35 and you will see climate as one of their biggest issues, trying to explain to people, you will get nothing on climate for 30 years, if you do not control the courts, that would be a winning political argument, but Democrats don't make it. So, so in the 2060s, in the 2070s, long after Trump and all these current people are dead, the, 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 the judges that he put on the court will still be retarding our ability to meet the global climate threats of the future. You think the Democrats actually know what's going on or are they so compromised and committed to going after the sort of third way, the middle way, uh, the, the, ba the 
individual, the, the center of the country, essentially, that they've forgotten about their base. Um, is that what's going on or is it something else? I think it's something else, actually. I think what it is, is that Democrats do, don't feel like the court is a winning issue for them. They feel like it's a winning issue for the right. And that's because the right wing has cultivated a whole you know, army of single issue voters on the Supreme Court, right? So I can go to a tabernacle in Utah and I can find a person who doesn't know anything about civics, who doesn't know anything about, about how the law works, who doesn't like Donald Trump, who thinks that he's a racist, sexist, misogynist person, but will vote for Republicans up and down the ticket because they care about abortion. You can go find that person in parts of this country. It's very hard on the other side to find that person on the Democratic side especially on the on the hard left, right? It's hard to find the hard left progressive who is going to be a single issue voter on the Supreme Court. I can, you know, you, you can have people just like, well, you know, both parties are the same in terms of medical care for all. And you can say, well, maybe, but like the both justices aren't the same. One- Do you think that's changing though? Because I mean, I, I just, do you think that's changing in this moment? The fact of this incredibly extreme- Supreme Court with a six to three conservative supermajority. I mean, are Democrats maybe waking up that they are perhaps single issue voters on some things? We just talked about 2020. 2020 convention, went through the whole convention, didn't mention the courts at all. That's strike one. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, the Of the people running for the Democratic nomination for president in 2020, Joe Biden was the most conservative when it came to the courts. Everybody, Pete Buttigieg had a whole plan to maybe think about reimagining the courts. Bernie Sanders was out there. Maybe we need 100 justices. He doesn't know. Like Everyone was like at least expansion curious, right? But not Joe Biden. And it didn't cost him a vote. But he and also was the only one who actually said he was going to do something potentially historic vis-a-vis -vis the courts. And that was to name a Black woman. And that's what won him South Carolina. Yes. Yes. That's... That's Isn't great. Isn't that evidence but, that there's some interest? I mean, I wonder what 2016 would have looked like if after Hillary Clinton selected Tim Kaine to be her running mate, she had gone further and said, and if I am elected president, I'm going to name Goodwin Liu of the California Supreme Court as the first Asian American justice or Tino Cuellar of this California Supreme Court as the second Latino justice. Would that have put a third person on that ticket to give it a little lift and energy that would have brought some voters out? I think it might have. I'll do you one better, Professor Murray. If Barack Obama had nominated Kataji Brown Jackson last time when she was a finalist for the seat that eventually went to Merrick Garland, maybe the unprecedented obstruction by Mitch McConnell wouldn't have worked. I mean, I think a lot of, I was one of the I, people. I think that's exactly right. I think right? That, exactly. that a lot of people criticize Obama for nominating Garland when he had people like Brown Jackson um, in the wings who might've inspired more um, progressive uh, uh, energy and made the Republicans look worse as they were doing their obstruction. But basically your arguments are that there, there, is a slow, there is a change amongst progressives to care more about the courts than perhaps they did in the past. And I'm- I would Structural reform this year, expanding the court, limiting life tenure. And I can't agree with you until I see a Democrat pay the price, right? Because we, we just haven't seen a Democrat lose a vote, lose a primary, lose, and we haven't seen a senatorial Democrat lose a primary over the court's issues. It happens to Republicans all the time. People forget, like I, I just said, talked about 2020, 2020, let's go back to 2016, where Donald Trump, anti-establishment, outsider guy, just, just throwing Republican establishments just overboard, just destroying, not with the court. No, no, no. When it came to the court, he had to put out that list that federal society approved list, Donald Trump had to toe the line when it came to Supreme Court nomination. Everything else, it could be crazy outsider man, but with Supreme Court, Republicans don't play. They would have elected Jeb if they thought they were gonna lose the court, but so he had to play, he had to play with the establishment when it came to the Supreme Court, everything else, it could be crazy. And so that's what I'm saying, Republicans lose when they are weak on courts. I haven't seen a Democrat lose for being weak on courts. And even if you take you know a, a more recent example, Dick Durbin is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee because it's his turn. I just grabbing I mean, Dick Durbin's a fine man. I, I don't have a problem, but she, but he's not Sheldon Whitehouse. 
Sheldon Whitehouse, who every day is making a new chart. Every Sheldon Whitehouse spends every day like in Excel, like making new charts with like string about like the Federal Society and where the money is coming from and the Heritage Foundation and and the Judicial Act. He understands the entire room, but he couldn't get that job. No, because it was Dick Durbin's term. That's how Democrats roll. And until that stops happening, I think we're going to continue fighting an asymmetrical war here. Right. Um, is there any sort of small policy fix that we can make that would help any of this? I think court expansion is pretty small. I mean, it's just a, it's just a simple bill. <laughs> no, I, I think Joe Biden thinks it's a third rail. Like, right. Do you think structural reform is the answer? I, mean, I, I, I do think structural reform really is the answer, but I, I, I will give you something small. Ethics reform. Right, you know, people outside of our world, Professor Murray, are are just latterly, thanks to Jane Mayer and the New Yorker. Oh, this Jenny Thomas person seems to be corrupt. Yeah, thirty years of it, folks. Um, the 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 bald corruption of the Thomases is getting air now. The bald corruption of, of Brett Kavanaugh got some play back when he was nominated. The Supreme Court is the only court, is the only uh, court in the country that operates without ethics rules. Yes. According to the court, only uh, the individual justice justices can hold themselves to any standard. That's ridiculous, and a very kind of small bore change to change the ethic, to apply ethics rules to the Supreme Court might actually do some good. Let's actually put in when justices must recuse themselves from cases. That might be of a help, you know, at least might might uh, uh, lessen their ability to literally go out and fundraise on behalf of a political organization like the Federal Society. That might stop, right? So, you know, you you, you can imagine some, and generally people are in, fa- are in favor of ethics. Like in generally ethics po- polls high. So I think that in terms of a small bore kind of uh, uh, transitional change, just the concept that ethics should be applied to the Supreme Court would be a step in the right direction. You, you've mentioned the Jane Mayer article in The New Yorker about Ginny Thomas and her connections with far right conservative organizations and how that has sort of influenced um, or has come up in petitions to the court and cases that are argued before the court where her husband sits. Um, There's also a New York Times magazine profile just last week on on the same thing. Has the battle against these dark money forces really changed in the last few years because of the energy of perhaps Senator Whitehouse or the reporting efforts of folks like Jane Mayer? I don't know that it's, again, I, I, I can't say that it's changed until I see some consequences. Like it's it, what, what we are now seems to be. And I think this goes for, for, for many things. I think this goes to why I wrote the book, right? What we are in right now is a point where we are trying to get information into the hands of people who maybe haven't been paying attention the entire time, right? So we're kind of in a stage of don't worry about being late to the party. Let's just embrace the fact that you showed up at all. Like that's where we are today, right? But we are still a very long way from taking that new information, taking that new focus, and turning it into action, turning it into consequences, turning it into results. We're still, that, that, that's still a dream as opposed to a reality. Um, I hope we get there. And I hope that, that as with so many things, I hope that the younger generation is, is ready to lead the way on this. I think when you look at the energy that they have around climate, at the energy they have around guns, if you can just explain to them that the courts are the things that are preventing them from getting those things forward, that are preventing those policies from happening, um, that could create a lot of energy around taking back the courts from the Republicans to say nothing of, you know, the 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 worst thing that could happen to conserve uh, this is gonna this is gonna sound a little pie in the sky, but we are there's also the potential that the worst thing that can happen for conservatives is them getting exactly what they want because they're about to get exactly what they want. They're about to take away a woman's right to choose. They're about to unleash guns onto our subways and increase the number of mass shootings that we have. They're about to destroy climate change legislation. They're about to get rid of affirmative action. They're about to take take away gay rights and trans rights. And once we are living in that conservative theocracy that they have so long wanted, uh, perhaps people will realize that it's not a great place to live and be willing to do something about it. The only upside of the next 
three or four years of this conservative supermajority is the prospect, perhaps, that their work spurs political action and galvanizes the left. I hope it's three or four years. I thought you were going to say three or four decades. <laughs> I'm just sort of thinking in the short term. Um, it, a couple of questions, like like two last questions before we go. Um, what do we do? Like, it seems so much of this is focused on the courts, but the Senate is also a real problem. And so one listener would like to know, what should we do about Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema and their rigidity on these questions? Um, I'd love for you to weigh in, like, what would you do? Were you in charge? Well, first of all, let's remember, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema have actually been pretty reliable when it comes to, to Biden's judicial appointments. They've been terrible on the filibuster and terrible on structural reform change because they're not they're not reformers, they're, they're, they're corrupted. But on the actual justices, they've been pretty good. So I'm not just just I'm not super worried about them in terms of this current nomination fight. Look, one of the reasons why I am in favor of court extension and people don't really understand this, uh, this until I I spell it out, is that it is a way to fix the obviously broken Senate confirmation process. So if you had 20 more justices, 30 more justices, I mean, literally like big numbers here, then changing them out would become rote. It would become not a make or break, you know, everybody to the mattresses kind of moment for the political parties. It would just be like, oh, and today we also nominated a new three or four in the same way that it already is for the lower courts, where it's generally rote, where, you know, you can have uh, uh, justices like Katanji Brown Jackson um, get 53 votes for the D.C. Circuit because they're like, oh, whatever. You know, it's just it's just a thing that they do as, as part of the normal course of business. Having more Supreme Court justices would do that. Another thing that it would do is that it would, I think, make for much more moderate opinions. People say we want mainstream moderate opinions. Now, personally, I don't. I like crazy lefty opinions. That's just me. But if you want you know, mainstream kind of center mass moderate opinions, let me tell you something. Trying to get 15 of your friends, if you had a if you had a, a 29 person court and so to get a majority, you needed 15 people on your majority. That's going to make for much more mainstream opinion. I like to say, if you just have to convince three or four of your boys to go out for a night, you could end up at a strip club. You could end up at a, at a, at a drag race. You could end up at some places, right? If you got to convince 15 of your friends to go out for a night, you're going to end up at Applebee's. You're going to end up at Olive Garden. You're going to end up at a, at a nice safe family place, right? And so if you want moderate decisions, what you want is more justices because it means for a larger majority that you have to herd together. So I, I, like, again, someone needs to just, you need to write this up in an op-ed with like the Applebee's versus the strip club theory of judicial <laughs> nominations. Um, I, I would I would read it, I would buy it. Um, one last question, let's end on hopefully a high note, um, fingers crossed. Uh, we just got a new nomination, an historic, groundbreaking nomination of Ketanji Brown Jackson to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, the first Black woman to ever sit on the Supreme Court if she is to be confirmed. Uh, does it make you hopeful or is it just more of the same? Like, surely this sparked a little flame of warmth in your cold, dead heart. Yes, because we're getting rid of Breyer. No, I'm just trying. I'm just joking. Just joking. Breyer's a very nice man. He's look, Breyer doesn't get enough credit for it. He's been one of the best He's justices. He's a San Francisco native. You can't do this here. <laughs> what? He's a Massachusetts guy. Come on. He's he was raised. He went to Lowell High School. He's a San Francisco. He was on the first guy. circuit. He's mad. We'll He's, fight about you this later. can't do that here. Okay. You can't. You can't, come, you can't claim Breyer, for example. We'll do this later. Look, <laughs> Breyer doesn't get enough credit for it. He's honestly like the most uh, justice against the death penalty that we've had for quite some time. I think that's great. Of course, I'm excited about Brown Jackson. I'm excited because she has, you know, we've talked about this before, but she will come to the court with more uh, public defense experience than any justice since Thurgood Marshall. I think that's critical. I think that that's good. I think that that you know people say like, oh, will she be able to convince Repub? No, no. You, you Neil Gorsuch is not convincible on anything, right? Brett Kavanaugh, he just he's such a weak moral person that he just goes with the strongest man in the room. She's not going to do. But you know what? She might convince. She might convince Kagan on a couple of things. 
She might convince Sotomayor, who both, you know, Sotomayor has, has prosecutorial experience. She might pull Sotomayor on a couple of things. Sotomayor might pull her on a couple of things. Like, just sometimes just getting the liberals together to stay together would be enough of a victory for me. So I, I, I have hope that that not only for the quality of her work and the quality of her opinions and her reasoning, I do have hope that, like, having people with her kind of background and experience give, you know, some, if nothing else, somebody to give Sotomayor and Kagan another friend on the bench. Like, I think all of that stuff is good. And you never know how history plays out. You said it for three or four years. I worry about three or four decades. But like, nobody expected Scalia to die. You know, these people, these are old people. People get hit by buses every day in this country, right? Um, you never know what's going to happen. And having actual liberals on the court um, is always a good thing. So yeah, I, I have a lot of hope for, for her career. I will be watching it with interest. I'm sure I'll be writing about it a lot. Um, I think she's going to kill it at the confirmation hearings. I mean, we've got a public debate, you know, high school debate champion. Um, she's she's going she's gonna, to she's gonna wreck people at the hearings and that's going to be fun to watch. Um, I think she'll be a great Supreme Court justice for, you know, the next uh, 30 years. You would have also been great. No, don't get me wrong. But you've got, you've still got a lot of time. I'm, I'll be rooting for you. For the next one, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think I think she's going to be great. I think we're going to. I think we're in good hands with her. I just need to get her more help. I just need ten people look good like her to get to get on to get on and, and, and be with her, right? So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll end with this. Now that the Kataji Brown Jackson hype train has left the station, I feel like I've done my job on that. I'm on the Dale Ho hype train. Let's go. Uh, let's go for Ho. Um, I, we need the first Asian American on the court, Dale Ho, ATLU. Um, he's 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 going to be he's my pick for that. So let's get on that hype train. We need more. In the words of Kermit the Frog, we need more dogs and cats and chickens and bears and things. All right. On that hopeful note, uh, we will end there tonight. So please join me in thanking Ellen Mistal for joining us today and discussing his new book. Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guide's Guide to the Constitution. And thank you so much to the audience for watching and for participating live and for your terrific questions. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Melissa Murray. Thank you for joining us tonight and please stay safe and healthy. <laughs>